Podcast, presented by Reverend Edmund Denand, pastor of the Twin Cities Baptist Church, located at G5339 South Saginaw in Flint, just south of Maple Road. It's a wonderful, wonderful life when you know my Lord of all. It's a wonderful, wonderful life when he says. There's a joy that you never once knew, and a peace in the darkest night, as you travel along, in your heart there's a song, it's a wonderful, wonderful life. Now this I do what we call secondary separation, that's a big thing these days. And the idea is that uh, one bunch of people are separated from liberals and modernists, and another bunch of people are separated not only from liberals and modernists, but from all the people who support liberals and modernists, or from all people who support those who support liberals and modernists, <laughs> or from those who support those who support those who might support somebody who is thinking of supporting, you know, so forth and so on. All right, Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, a yoke is something where two animals have to pull together. A yoke of oxen is a couple of oxen hooked up with a yoke, and the yoke runs down the middle of them, and then it goes across the necks. So they it's forbidden here that you get yoked up with an unsaved person. Now, a yoke means this. It means when one animal moves, the other animal has to move. That's that. That separation there is clear. In other words, you can't get hitched up with an unsaved person so that every time they move, you have to move. And under that, of course, would come marriage. The reason why marriage is forbidden being saved and unsaved people is because in a marriage, they're one flesh. And the Bible says, Now, along that line, you get this matter of labor union. And somebody says, What about that? Well, I've studied the thing long and hard, and near as I can see, there's nothing wrong with the labor union at all. As long as you don't have to do wrong when they do wrong. Now, Bob Jones Sr. had something very wise to say about this. He's a very wise man. I don't want to ever have you confuse Bob Jones Sr. with Bob Jones the second or the third or the fourth or the three and three quarters or whatever it is. But Bob Jones Sr. used to say, it is never a compromise to go as far as you can along the right road with anybody. It is always a compromise to go any distance along the wrong road with anybody. Now, that's a profound saying. I'm not saying here that it's never a compromise to go as far as you can along the right road with anybody. That isn't a yoke. In plain words, if you had Catholics and Jews in Detroit that got together and they wanted to have a petition go around uh, closing all X-rated adult movies, you could sign it. I'd sign it. I'd put my sign signature right between a father and a rabbi. I don't believe either one of them, but, I, but if they're trying to do right, I can back them up where they're doing right. Same with that moral majority thing. Now, we don't support that thing financially, but if he's trying to do right, okay, I'm with him as long as he's trying to do right. Now, if he gets in a position where I've got to do wrong, then I've got to branch off with him. Good examples are when Billy Graham comes to town, has a meeting, uh, I couldn't go to the meeting. Why? Because people look at me as a pastor, and if I support the meeting, they think I support everything he supports. I'll, I'll not do it. However, I won't tell my people, you can't go. I mean, Billy Graham comes to town, Bob Jones says, and he stood on his ship, goes with me. Why, you fascist fool, what are you talking about? That isn't American. You've got a meeting you want to go to. Paul Roberts come to ground, get down, go see him. Now, you need to laugh once in a while. <laughs> I want these fellows come in, it doesn't hurt you to go see him. If somebody invited me to come and preach at a Catholic church, I'd go. Somebody's a Ruppman preaching at a Catholic church? Sure I would. Bet your life I would. I wouldn't get invited back, <laughs> but I, but as far as that goes, I preached one time at Tennessee Temple and didn't get invited back. I preached one time at the Bible Baptist uh, College in Springfield and didn't get invited back. I preached one time at Arlington, the Bi World Baptist Fellowship didn't get invited back, and I preached as far as that goes with the Assembly of Bob Jones one time and didn't get invited back. I've been to all four places, one time, one night stand. I have a message I preach at those places. It has a magic touch. You know what it's called? It's called the whole armor of God. 
Isn't that a strange thing? Here's an outfit that professes to be militant. Here's a guy that gets up and preaches, and he's the son of a colonel and the grandson of a general and a great-grandson of a general, and has four generations of military blood in him, and he's a dog face, and his brother's a dog face, and he gets up and preaches in the whole armor of God, and everybody gets scared to death and heads for the bushes. My, aren't we militant? Fourteen, being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. All right, don't get in the thing where you're in a bind. As long as the union doesn't force you to do something wrong, there's nothing wrong with blowing the union at all. Now, if you're in a position where you have to do something wrong, then you've got to part company. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Obviously none. What communion hath light with darkness? They are the unsaved. What concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial is an Old Testament name. A New Testament name is Beelzebub. Children of the devil, wickedness. The word means vanity. That is nothingness. Concord hath Christ with Belial. Concord is an agreement. When the Pope wants to bring a country into subjection, he signs what, signs what they call a concordant. And a concordant is an agreement between the Pope and the country. Uh, the Pope's a pimp for a whore, and the whore is the Roman Catholic Church, Revelation 17. And the Pope is her pimp. You're welcome. You're welcome. I just try to talk for folks and understand me. You see, that's what they call them out in the world. Amen? Amen? You bet your boot is. He drums up business for the harlot. Oh, and you take that thing right there. When he wants to take over a country, he signs what they call a concordant. He signed with Charlemagne, Napoleon, Mussolini, Franco, and Adolf Hitler. Isn't that some company for a Christian to be keeping? My, what company? And that's a yoke. When they move, you have to move. When Hitler moves into Russia, all the Catholic bishops have to pray for the Third Reich. They're in a yoke. They're bound. That's what's forbidden. Uh, verse 15, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? The answer is none. All right, so separation obviously is this. Separation is obviously separation from unsaved people to where you're not yoked to them, to where when they move, you have to move. That's separation. Now, there's one more, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. And this has to do with saved people. Uh, I'll get 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in one hand, and while we're at it, pick up Romans 16, and I'll show you one that I never mentioned. I'll show you a passage on separation. You never heard from the platform of Bob Jones or Jack Van Impe, any, any, any place else. They've got them all divided off these days. Uh, Neo, uh, Jack Van Impey has what he calls neo-fundamentalists. And Bob Jones has what you call pseudo-fundamentalists. <laughs> so you have fundamentalists and pseudo-fundamentalists and neo-fundamentalists and fundamentalists and all this junk. Now, I'm a very simple-minded man, no matter what you heard. And I believe in, I believe in black and white, up and down. I like uh, baked potatoes with butter, see? Never mind the mayonnaise and the fricassee and the scallop. Just baked potatoes with butter, okay? I like vanilla ice cream. As far as I'm concerned, ice cream is vanilla. There is no other kind of ice cream. You say, do you like butter? That's frozen dessert. Chocolate's frozen dessert. Ice cream is vanilla. That's what ice cream is. <laughs> Candy is chocolate. See? So I have peppermint. That's bonbons, you know delicate, is that something sweet, you know. Candy is chocolate. Just, I'm plain, you see. So with me, there are two kind of fundamentalists. There are Bible-believing fundamentalists, and there are apostate fundamentalists. And that's the only distinction I make. I make a distinction between those that believe the book and those who don't believe the book. Just that simple. I'll show you one here the apostates will never bring up. All right, 1 Corinthians 5, 9. I wrote you an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. Now watch it. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. He didn't tell you you couldn't have company with fornicators of this world. You can have company with fornicators of this world. Is that how that thing is worded? Now keep reading. Or with the covetous or extortioners with idolaters, for then must you need to go out of the world. Now what's he saying? He said, I told you not to have company of fornicators, but you can't avoid the company of unsaved fornicators, idolaters, and adulterers unless you blow your brains out. How are you going to get away from them? 
You fellas work out the job. You know what's going on. I know what's going on. I've been out there in the world. I ain't no spring chicken man. I've had an AFL button on my on my cap working for the steamship corporation, Chickasaw, Alabama, drilling holes in the bulkheads, man, with the put them light sockets in. I know what's going on. If some of the brethren don't, that's their problem. I know exactly what's going on. You fellas go to work, and the guy opens his toolbox. He's got Playboy girls all over the toolbox, don't he? You sit there and have a lunch break, and the guy's talking about scoring last night and whose wife he went out with, and you see so-and-so in that movie and X-rated television, that was some scene where she blankety-blank. I know what's going on. If some of the spring chickens don't know what's going on, I know what's going on. And you can't get rid of these fornicators and drunkards and extortionists and murderers unless you just blow your brains out. You can't avoid them. You're working with them. Some of the brethren are real. They're real stupid, you know. I mean, they... I don't ever eat a restaurant where they sell liquor. Well, you crazy fool, eat a restaurant where they smoke? <laughs> I don't ever eat a restaurant where they sell liquor. You buy your groceries at a grocery store where they sell liquor? You can get so separated, you're good for nothing. Yeah, I never buy gro I never buy groceries. They sell it. How about a gas station? They sell beer at the gas station when you gas up. You can't. You can't get away from unsaved people. How about the fellow you pay your taxes to? Is he saved? How about the guy who reads your light meter and your gas meter? Is he saved? You can't. You can't bust off all kidding with unsaved people unless you leave, leave the world. Eleven. But now I have written to you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. There's a saved person. Be a fornicator or a covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one, no, not to eat. That has nothing to do with supporting the orthodox. That warning there not to keep company with those brethren has nothing to do with whether they support Jimmy Swagger or Bill Bright or InterVarsity Crusade or Jack Van Impey or Old Roberts. That's got nothing to do with that. That thing says you're not to keep company with a Christian who's not living right. Nothing about what he supports. And my, what a list. A fornicator. Okay, you get a Christian stepping out and his wife, running around living like the devil in the flesh, you know to steer clear of him. Or covetous. <whistles> Boy, what if you cut off fellowship with all Christians who are covetous? Wouldn't that cut down your fellowship a little bit? I never heard Becky Horton or Bob Jones talk about that. Kind of quiet there, aren't you, boy? Getting all this land, $170 million plant, buying up all these acres and buying up all these buses and coveting all these houses that aren't yours. Kind of got your mouth shut about that, don't you? Talking about neo-orthodox and Barth and Bruner and evangelical. How about these covetous brethren? <laughs> hey there. <laughs> or idolater or railer or drunkard or an extortioner with such a one know not to eat. You don't have to have, sit down and have fellowship at the same table with those kind of Christians. All right, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. I don't believe in a secondary separation at all. I believe in, like the book says, I believe I don't get in a place where I'm yoked with somebody that's doing something wrong, and I don't have fellowship and company with Christians who aren't living right. And that's where my separation ends. All this stuff, all this stuff. Brother Denon had Brother Ruckman in. Get him off the board. <laughs> Brother Ruckman had Brother Bob Gray and kick him off the board. Bob Gray got kicked off the board of Bob Jones because he came down and preached at our place. I invited a teacher at one of these schools in the country to come preach me, and they found about they said that he'd lose his job if he came and preached for us. You know what that is? That's the work of a bunch of little sissified, brownie, campfire girls, spoiled brats. And tell them that if you see them. I was, I'll tell you, I, I, I've got a lot of shortcomings. I'll tell you, I was a man 27 years before I was a preacher, and I didn't lose my manhood when I got saved. They're not going to browbeat me, all that stuff. Did you hear who so-and-so had in? So-and-so supports so-and-so. So-and-so had so-and-so on his platform. You know who had it, his platform? Yeah, 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 yeah. We had a, we had a saying when I was a boy, it said, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And all that stuff about so and so supporting so and so, you know who you know who should come to this pulpit here at this church. Anybody your pastor puts in that pulpit in this church, that's his pulpit. No fellowship has his business telling him who he can have in there and who he can't have in there. 
all this stuff. Folks getting all over Rollins because he had Harrington in. Folks getting all over uh, Fowell because he had uh, one of those one of those blacks in. I forget his name. Why, well, it's nothing to me. I don't particularly believe in Harrington or one of these blacks he had in, but that's his pulpit. That's his business. Who he has in his pulpit. I don't care. Made no difference to me. If he invited me in, I'd go in right after Jesse Jackson. <laughs> Wouldn't bother me any. Of course, I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about getting that kind of invitation. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share. <laughs> yeah, I hate that word. I'll share something with you. Uh, we're up at Baptist Fundamentalism. I went there, you know, a couple of years back. So I will have that thing. I got some friends up there, too, believe it or not, you know. And I was up there going around through there, and some of my fellows, I took up the pass out tracks on the way down to the, to the whatever it was. And they stopped an old color boy that gave him a track, one of those Washington blacks, and gave him a track and asked if he was saved. And he said, no, sir. He said, you read this? Yeah, I'll read that. They said, I want to ask you something. And that's, you know, that Jesse Jackson was down with Cuba Castro and shooting off his mouth and carrying on like to do. And uh, he said to that black fellow, he said, would you vote for Jesse Jackson if he's running for president? And that old color boy said, shoot, no, man. <laughs> And our white boy said, why is that? He said, man, if you white folks can't run this country, how do you think I think you're going to run it? <laughs> I told him, I said, I'd vote for that man, boy. Put him in. I'll vote for him. And there's a man got some sense. Amen, amen, amen. 1617. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. How do you spot them? By good words. They choose their speech real carefully. And fair speeches. They're all real smooth and slick and flattering and butter you up. Deceive the hearts of the simple. You're to separate yourself from them. That's Romans chapter 16. I never heard that mentioned any conference in separation. Look out for that bunch that have that smooth, slick, cultured, polished, positive talk. Stay away from them. All right, something else. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Get this on here. Yeah, tell me about it. Just put it on. We're going to get it on tape. Uh, could you touch on the inheritance that a Christian can lose in the kingdom of God? All right. Take your Bible and get Colossians chapter 3. And uh, Galatians chapter 5, Colossians 3 and Galatians 5, and then with your third hand, trouble most of these, you have to have three hands to get them, is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now this has to do with inheritance. And again, this is a doctrine, it isn't, it isn't taught in the schools. The stuff in the Word of God doesn't show up anywhere. You get these things where the teaching is, well... The important thing is just the fundamentals. They don't even agree on the fundamentals. There are two kinds of fundamentalists. Now, I know what kind you're used to, because I know you're pastor, and I know the kind of teaching you've had. You've had, a, you've had a teaching where the autonomy of the local church, separation of the church and the state, the immersion of the believer in eternal security, and the premillennial coming of Christ are considered to be fundamental. And I'm that way myself. I believe those are just as fundamental as anything else. But your Presbyterian interdenominational type of fundamentalist only has five fundamentals. And those five fundamentals are in the Roman Catholic Apostles' Creed, which makes every Catholic in the world a fundamentalist, and also every charismatic. From the fundamentalists object to the charismatic being called fundamentalists, if they believe in the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the crucifixion, the bodily resurrection, and the second coming in some form, they are a fundamentalist according to the fundamental state of a Bob Jones University in the Creed. I've got the pants at home, Bob Jones used a sermon, the fundamentals. Those fundamentals, I believe, are all charismatic and Catholics. Now, you folks, whether you know it or not, you are a Texas brand of fundamentalism. And the Texas brand comes from Springfield or Arlington, and both of them come from J. Frank Norris. And J. Frank Norris was not an interdominational, ecumenical type of fundamentalist. He was a Baptist fundamentalist. All right, now uh, Colossians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This goes beyond the fundamentals. Colossians 3, 23. Watch it carefully. Whatsoever you do, works. 
do it heartily, works, as of the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward, works, of inheritance. For you serve, works, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong, works, shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, works, and there is no respect of persons. Now you see that? That passage says that the inheritance, verse 24, is an earned reward. Now, how could anybody get that confused with eternal life? Don't you believe by grace you're saved through faith? Don't you believe the gift of God is eternal life? Then why would you think the inheritance the kingdom of God having to do with, with, uh, with grace? Inheriting the kingdom of God has to do with an earned reward. All right, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now, in this first list in Galatians 5, you're given a list of works. This is not a list of people. This is a list of works. When we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll be looking at a list of people, not of works. That's very important because the works you're about to read in Galatians chapter 5 are the works of the flesh, not the works of an unsaved man. They're the works of the flesh, and the context is in the flesh of a Christian. All right, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Well, I'll begin at verse 16 so you get the context. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. I'd aim at a saved man or unsaved man. I may say saved man. Why, sure. Walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Is that the saved man or lost man? Saved man. And these are contrary to one another, so you cannot do the things you would. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Now notice this, the works of the flesh. In who? In the Christian. In the Christian. Look at verse 20, look at verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit. Talking about the two natures of the Christian. All right, one nature of spiritual brings forth fruit. The other nature is flesh and brings forth works. Then the child of God. Then what follows? What follows is a list of everything you heard of, ever heard of unsaved people doing. We have a fellow down there in Pensacola. He's a five-point tulip hard-shell Calvinist named L.R. Shelton, Jr. He's a L.R. Shelton, Jr.'s son. L.R. Shelton out of New Orleans, the old five-point tulip Calvinist. And that crazy cockeyed nut is getting on the radio every Saturday and Sunday and telling people that if they are guilty of any of the sins listed in 2 Timothy 3 or Galatians chapter 5, they're unsaved. And he gets on there and says, you have to look out for this gospel of carnal Christianity. And this gospel of carnal Christianity is not the true gospel, because the true gospel sets a man free from the law and free from the law of sin and death, so the man who's saved by the real gospel of grace doesn't ever commit any of these things. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to talk his congregation out of the salvation. He's trying to convince his congregation if they're not all living sinless lives, they've never really been saved. And that means he himself is just as carnal as a devil. Any man that professes to be saved on the basis of how good he lives is flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery. That's clear. Married couples messing around. Fornication. That's clear. Anybody messing around. Uncleanness, cover number number of things. Lasciviousness, that's like pornography. Idolatry, putting anything ahead of God. Witchcraft, can a Christian get involved with witchcraft? Sure, Johnny Todd. You say, is he saved? Yeah, he's saved. You say, what you doing? He's still fooling with it. <laughs> Rasmussen kicked him out of the church because he was fooling with it. Now, you take Jack Chick. Jack Chick's a fine fellow. I know him real well. Fine fellow. There's only two things about Jack Chick that are wrong far as I know. First of all, he's kind of gullible. Jack Chick tends to believe anything anybody tells him. And the second thing about him is he's a reporter. When Jack Chick puts out the Godfather in Alberto, he isn't telling you necessarily what he believes. He's telling you what the other guy told him. I get letters all the time. People say, well, how do you support Jack Chick after he said this and after he said this? And they follow this fellow, Alberto Rivera, so fake and blah, 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 blah. I write back to those Christians and say, do you take a newspaper? They do. 
You pay and subscribe, you give money for somebody to take a newspaper and bring it to your house, and that thing is 85% lies from cover to cover. You never holler about it at all, you pay for it. So if you buy some of Jack Chick's stuff, and sometime he might have something that isn't quite right, but don't get upset about it. I mean, I think sometimes there's some of the stuff in there is not right, but it isn't Jack Chick's. He's reporting what the guy gave him. Johnny Todd gave him a big old lie, and he had this thing, you know, in witchcraft, you know, and Johnny Todd was one of the 13 witches that ran the world. <laughs> Cut it out, man. <laughs> Cut it out. I suppose he told Hitler what to do, or he told, you know, I told him, he told Vito Genovese, you know, who to hit, you know, that kind of stuff. All, all that stuff, man. One of the 13 witches. What a, what a thing, man. So first time I heard Johnny Todd, I made a tape on him, you know. And I just made a fool out of him and called him everything but white and turned it loose. Not a fool got real upset with me. And then about a year later, Rasmussen churched him, kicked him out of his church down there for not paying money owed. And they caught him teaching witchcraft to the young people in the young people's department. I got the stuff at home with Rasmussen's signature on it. Rasmussen ain't no liar. He sent out over 20,000 copies of his argument with Custer all over the country. He got the stuff on him. And they had got out of church because he made a tape. He forgot to degouse the back tape as Johnny Young people in the Young People's Department. You're just living after the flesh. Witchcraft. Hatred. Now, you wouldn't be guilty of that, would you? <laughs> you never heard of a Christian hating anybody, have huh? Aren't people funny, you know? Here's old Bob Jones. Look out for a new evangelical. Look out for the... Hey, bud, how about hating your brother's guts? How about that? Will that do okay? Oh, Ruckman hates everybody. No, it's just the way I talk. <laughs> I don't hate nobody. Honest to God, I don't hate nobody. Not even the Pope. I'd like to see somebody get rid of him, but I wouldn't get rid of him. <laughs> And it wouldn't know no good, no good to get rid of me, just get another one. I'm no use to martyr a guy that doesn't make a martyr out of him, you know. I don't hold against anything personally against that by lying in the face of this earth. God is my witness. Now, if they're going to attack the Bible, I'm going to kick the britches. But uh, I've got nothing against them personally. The matter to me, I've got uh, what they say about me is immaterial. The guy pulled me up, apologized me about sending me a very strong letter, cussing me out, and he said, I know you're strong, Brother Ruckman. I thought to myself, well, you silly fool, you silly fool, hang up, man. What are you, what are you trying to give me anyway? I know you're strong. That's the way a woman talks. I know you're strong because you can take a bad letter. Oh, cut it out, will you? Cut it out. I'll tell you what tells when you're strong, man, when they got you tied down the front room and got your boy or girl back in the kitchen putting their hand on a burner on the stove and trying to get you to reject Christ. And your kid is kid screaming and saying, Daddy, make him stop it. Daddy, make him stop it. Then we'll see how strong you are. I know what strength is. I don't profess to be strong. You're strong because you can take a bad letter. What a fool. What a blank fool. Amen, 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 amen. Hatred. Variance. Emulation. That's like jealousy. Wrath. Strife. You've never seen a bunch of Christians strive, have you? I've seen them in business meeting and stand up, a lady take a Bible and hit a guy right in the face with it. In a church business meeting, hit him with a Bible, blap, you know. Holy Bible, authorized version, blap. <laughs> Heresies, that's Ruckman. Envings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before as I have told you in time past. Now watch it. That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's aimed at a Christian. And he said, you do those things, you'll lose an inheritance. Why? Because an inheritance is an earned reward. Colossians chapter 3. Now, I'll come to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'll show you how you know this thing is so. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse uh, 9. Here's how you know this thing is true. Did you ever, I've done this many times, I've been at many a Christian camp when it got come, the competition got kind of hot. You know, flesh is flesh. And you get a bunch of young guys together, you know, about 20, 25, playing softball and blood ball and basketball, and tempers get hot. 
and umpire makes a call and somebody argues the umpire, you know. I've been in those Christian camps for I don't even know how long. I was telling Brother Denant the other day at the table, I said, I know I'm getting old because I'm playing blood ball with the grandchildren <laughs> of the guys I played blood ball with in Chautauqua. That's rough, man. That's rough. Man, you're playing blood ball these guys at Chautauqua in 1957 and 1958, and now you're playing with the grandchildren. And the grandchildren are 17, 18 years old. And I know I'm slipping. I'm going to have to quit after a while. I mean, I, the last couple of years, it's been getting near quitting time. I can tell. <laughs> I'm still playing hockey, but 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 that, that blood ball, that thing is just all... You know, gripping and arm locks and wrist holes and head locks and hair locks and hammer locks and full Nelsons. My muscle ain't holding together like they used to. <laughs> Last time I got in there, I played with one guy. I taught him how to play, and he's about 35 now. I played when he was 15. I taught him how to play, and I used to beat that guy to death. You know, he's about 17. And I got in the pool with him last summer. He knocked me around like a ball bearing in a garbage can. Now, I don't know why. I know where I was at. And about two summers ago, playing blood ball, one of them got my left eye and got a, got a, got a nail on it, cut the eyeball. And then last summer when I was playing with him, I had to tangle some guy who's about 30 years old, about uh, six feet and about 240. And I uh, climbed like, out of a 17 inch leg, like climbing a mountain trying to get to him. And he got a hold of that thumb and like to pull that thing out. Man, I got out of the pool and I told the guy, pull that thing, and he yanked it, and I said, pull it again, and he hit it again, about the scream, and somebody said, well, what broken it is now? <laughs> and that thing swelled up about the size of a softball and turned black, and I couldn't hold a chalk that night, man. I was holding the chalk between this thing and another finger. I couldn't get my finger on the chalk. And that thing quit hurting after about two weeks, and after about two months, I got where I could, you know, grip something again. And I couldn't play blood ball for another two months. And I played blood ball last Saturday with him again. <laughs> but that grip wasn't what it should have been. I mean, I was losing a lot of holes. <laughs> so I'm have to quit somewhere down the line. But that stuff is flesh, you see. And I'm fleshy like anybody else. I just never could resist it. I came up here. My wife said to me about eight years ago, she said, what are you going to be when you grow up? <laughs> And I said, I'm going to be a hockey goalie. <laughs> and the next year, I got to play goalie. The next year. I got an I, I was I, I must I must give Michigan credit. I got ice skates the first time in Lansing, Michigan. And I was 61 years old. And I got on the skates, could actually stand up, <laughs> and got to playing. And I played my first game in about two hours. We had played an outdoor rink, 20 degrees. I never knew I never knew that game was. I knew, I knew it was a good game. I knew it was that good. Now, you talk about sweating, boy, at 20 degrees, you just sweat like a horse. I mean, at 20 degrees, man, you take your stock and cap off and just wring it out. And I went back after that game, got back home. I remember the night after I got back home, I was sitting in the living room, the cold night down there, and we were burning a fire in the fireplace. And I like getting back home, and I'm going to enjoy being my wife and my girls. But, you know, you know women, you know. And, and, I was, and I was sitting there in the you know, look out across that living room, and my wife was there, and the two girls, Laura and Rachel, they're about, they're about 11, 13. And I, I was enjoying being home. I look out across that living room, that living room just turned blue. <laughs> it just went into a big blue strip of ice out there, you know, and I hear those little bodies going, blam, 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 against the wall, you know, and hit these old sticks, clack, 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 you know. I went to the telephone. I phoned Green up on the phone long distance. The Lansing, I said, if you guys playing hockey tonight, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and he said, we just finished the game. <laughs> well, I still go to those camps. I still play with them. I've seen this many a time. I've seen many a time a guy slide in the third or a tie up at home and the umpire say out. And some Christian boy saying, look out now, look out now. All liars have their part in the lake which birth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, you know. Well, that, that verse is in there. Did you read that verse? It says, all liars shall have their part. Are you a liar? You see the dispensational problem you get into that a Christian faculty at a Christian school can't handle? 
They don't know what they're talking about. The verse says, all liars should go to hell. Haven't you told some lies? Well, why do you figure you're saved? It said all liars. That's what it said. Isn't that what it said? That's what it said, did it? You don't believe it? Go look it up. Revelation chapter 22. All liars shall have their part. It's there. Now, what are you going to do with that? You're not going to do anything with it unless you get your Bible right. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's get it right. 6 9. This one of Ruckman is peculiar teaching, you know. 6 9. Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Now, look at that. The unrighteous shall not inherit. You just read in Galatians, the works of the flesh and those that do such things shall not inherit. Now you're reading it's people. Know ye not the unrighteous, that's a man, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. You the fornicators, here he goes again. Nor idolaters, here he goes again. Nor adulterers, here he goes again. With the same things. But this time he's calling them people. He's not calling them the works of the flesh, nor effeminate, as you queer, abuse themselves with mankind, sodomites, lesbians, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall get to heaven? Nope. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now watch it carefully. Eleven. And such works. You were those things, amen? Weren't some of you idolaters, adulterers, fornicators, drunkards? Wasn't that some of you were? Or I took were some of you. But you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. You're no longer an adulterer. You're no longer a fornicator. You're no longer an idolater. You're a Christian. You're a Christian. You see, what if you do those things? Then you're committing the works of the flesh in a Christian. That solves your problems. Now, let's, I, I don't care what they say. If the book says it, that's it. There's no such thing as a Christian who is a liar. Now, you can call a guy a liar. I call them liars. But theologically, that isn't right. <laughs> if they're saved, they are a lying Christian. <laughs> See? A Christian is never a drunkard, but a Christian can get drunk. A Christian is never a thief, but a Christian can steal. Now, that's what's going on in those pastors. Now, you know why that ends? It has to do with spiritual circumcision, which is something else the faculty knows nothing about. So they can't get the Bible right any time they pick it up. Now, here's what you got. Here's a man right here. There's his flesh. That's old Peter Upman right there. That's flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. What well, there is. Or right, inside him is another man. That man's a soul. And that soul shaped just like that flesh. They don't know that either. They don't look to him for it. And that soul goes down. That soul has arms. It has nose, body, lips, teeth. Teeth. There should be weeping, wailing, gnash of teeth. Teeth, jaw, tongue, eyes, ears, nose, throat, mouth, ankles, ribs. And if that soul went to hell, it could burn. If our soul went to hell, it'd say, it lift up its eyes, being in torments, and say, send Lazarus, and dip the tip of his finger, and cool my what? You see that? I know what I'm talking about. And inside that body, there's a body shaped just like this one. It's a soul. And when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came in there and circumcised that soul, laser operation, and cut that soul loose from that body at every point under that flesh, so at not one place in my flesh does my soul touch my body. I'm circumcised. You say, what does that mean? Free. Free. Loose from my sins. Now, in the Old Testament, if I reached out and touched a dead body like that, I defile my soul. Because my soul is stuck to my flesh, my flesh gets dirty. The reason why Christ died on the cross was buried and rose from the dead was to set up a dispensation where God could get inside a man and not be defiled. Holy Spirit come to fell in the Old Testament, fell that gets defiled, Holy Spirit leaves him. Like Samson, like Saul. David's worried about that. David commits adultery and says, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He knows he got a problem. And God cut that soul loose in there so he could indwell that body without leaving that body. 
So when I get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in, cuts me loose, and my flesh commits a sin, and make no mistake about it, I'm no, you know, ultra grace. You still pay for it. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man so you still pay for it. You still suffer for it. He that sows the flesh shall the flesh eat. There's no way to get around it. Just because it isn't really you doing it, that don't mean you don't pay the piper. You pay the piper. I mean, you, you had charge of it. But that soul is not affected because that soul is not stuck to that body. The real me in there is sinless. Paul says, I delight after the law of God, after the inward man, and what I would, I do not. What I would not, that I do. So if I do, that which I would not. Listen, it is no more I that doeth it, but sin that dwelleth in me. O wretched man that I am, who shall live me from the body of this death? My problem is how to get out of this body, because this body gives me trouble. When I get out, I'll have it made. All right, so when I do something, I'm responsible for it. It's nature. If I tell a lie, I'm a liar. I'm not a liar. If I were to get drunk, I'm a Christian who got drunk, I would not get drunk. I'm a child of God. I remember one time, boy, if you're self-righteous, that stuff rubs you the wrong way, don't it? That really rubs you the wrong way. If you're trying to get to heaven by works, that just eats you up. <laughs> Um, you say, Ruckman, what you're trying to tell me is that you can lie and get away with it, and I can't. <laughs> now, I'm not telling you that. I'm saying a lie doesn't affect my salvation. And you're going to hell anyway. Whether you lie, amen, brother, whether you lie or not. Now, I'm not like Martin Luther. Martin Luther, he, he, he put it on too hard. I mean, they'd aggravate it. <laughs> and I understand that. I'm somewhat given to overstatement at times. I admit that. I've, some of my writings, they, you know, they, you know a little bit, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's like uh, Dr. DeHaan over there in, in, in Holland, Michigan, around there. Those reformers gave him such a time. Oh, DeHaan, he, he used to teach the Ten Commandments not to affect anybody. M.R. DeHaan. Said, the law is all done away with. No Ten Commandments for nobody. <laughs> I didn't write. The law is spiritual and good, Paul says. But you see, over there in Holland, Michigan, so many reformers kept getting up on Sunday and repeating the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments just aggravated the tar out of them to find he made a statement just a little bit too far. And the captains would tell old Martin, you see how man is justified by works, not by faith only. You see how man is justified James too. James too. They put James too in Martin, they'll find him Martin and said, someday I'm going to light my stove with James. Well, he wouldn't light his stove with James, but, but they just push him till he say it. And they push me. They push me. Well, finally, I say some things that, you know, just a little bit heavy. You know, I, you know, I say, take, you know, take these commentaries and throw them in the wastebasket. I don't throw them in the wastebasket. I use them. I've got them in my library down there, you know. I say these translations, you know, light the fire of them and let the cat sit on them, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I use 26 translations down there. I use my right commentaries. It's kind of over, you know. And so they can push in Martin. He'd get pushed. Martin used to say this. And Martin trying to prove, Martin trying to prove once you're saved, man, you're saved, which I believe. But, but Martin used to say every Christian ought to be a good, healthy sinner. He said, every Christian, you go out and get drunk once in a while, a trifle with a pretty maiden, just so the devil doesn't get an advantage of him. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm too Methodist to teach that, see. <laughs> but you, I know what Martin was trying to say. Martin was trying to say, don't the devil talk you out of your salvation no matter what. I know what he's trying to say. He just didn't say it right. <laughs> so the way that thing works is, a Christian, these things here... Essentially, the child of God is a Christian, essentially. But if he does the works, he loses the kingdom, and an unsaved man loses the kingdom, because an unsaved man doesn't come up till the kingdom's over. You know why the unrighteous don't inherit the kingdom? Because they're not there when it shows up. You ever something about something Christ said one time, or two times? He said one time, except the man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the next time he said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You wonder about that shot? That is some shot. One time he said, if you're not born again, you can't see it. 
The next time they said, if you're not born again, you can't enter it, he told them about two different things. You couldn't see one kingdom of God because Paul said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You enter that one, but you can't see it. Now, what do you mean over here? He said, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. He's talking about there when the kingdom of God shows up on this earth and you inherit it. He's talking about a millennial. Those are two different things. But a man has to be born again to get either one of them. You've got to be born again to get into the one that's invisible, the Holy Ghost. You've got to be born again to see the one that comes on the earth when it comes. And the unrighteous man, the unsaved, won't inherit the kingdom because he won't even be there to see it. He doesn't come up for the second resurrection. All right, let's get all this stuff together. What do we mean by this? Now that I've taught you that, I know I've taught you the truth, but when it comes to application, I'm not too sure about the application. Because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord himself shall send from heaven, the uh, shout, voice of archangel, trump of God, dead in Christ, so forth and so on, and caught up together with the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Or right, here comes the Lord. Suppose he comes now, and preferably now, better now than later, and he catches us up, we get up there and face the judgment seat of Christ, and then we have the marriage of the Lamb, then we come back down the earth to set up the kingdom. Well, here the Christian who lived this life according to the flesh. And the Bible says he won't inherit the kingdom. Well, then only one of two things must be. Either he must be left up there in glory, and the Lord comes back and sets down the kingdom up here without him, and the fellow's left up there. And that doesn't make much sense, because the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So he must come down with him. But if he comes down with him, then when he comes down here, there's nothing for him to inherit. So he's just kind of a traveling tourist <laughs> for a thousand years, kind of roaming around the countryside. He has no rain. Now, that's the most logical, and I'll show you why. I turn to Luke 19. That's the most logical. And by the way, there's an example of that in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And that example is Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, and afterward, listen, afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected and found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, you know what that stuff is telling you, Christian? It's telling you if you just mess around here after you're saved, just, you know, take care of yourself and pay for your bills and feed your family and feed your gut and take care of your children and take care of your lawn and your car, live after the flesh. That when Christ comes back, you'll be wanting to share the millennial reign with Christ. You'll get nothing, and you'll be born about it. Those tears aren't wiped away from all eyes in the Revelation chapter 20, and that's after the white throne judgment. It means you're going to say, well, God, I, if I well, give me a chance, Lord, to see you had your chance. You know what Paul said in Romans, or Second Timothy? If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. See? Now, a Christian people, the time to suffer is now. And after you've got a sinless body like Jesus Christ, you won't be able to hurt anymore. So the order is, first you get the cross, then you get the crown. No cross, no crown. You have over in Rome, I put up there the half a grapefruit in his head, walking around there with a crown on his head, sitting on the throne. He has a phone. They call him one of the princes of the church. And the guy has a crown. How many of you believe that? Let me see your hand. He has a crown. You ever watch television? <laughs> He's on a throne. It's called a pa Don't you get mad with me, you bigot. That's what they call it. They call it the papal throne. I didn't call it that. I mean, it could be an outhouse seat as far as I'm concerned. I'm not concerned about it. They call it a papal throne. Now, you know what that fellow thinks? He thinks he's reigning. He thinks he's reigning. He sure is in for a shock. No cross, no crown. Who are, whoever heard of Paul getting out of a, getting off a camel and having somebody spread out a purple carpet for Paul to walk down on? And then Paul stepped in the hole out of his ring and somebody bowed down and kissed it. 
and then Paul charged all the Roman citizens the tax money to set up his religious service so he could get up and hocus pocus abdominus fee fire full form e pluribus unum. Can you imagine that in the Bible? Trouble you Yankees, you're brainwashed. You get this stuff night and day and day and night and day and night, you actually think something to it, you know. Old pious fake, you're walking around, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Put that hex on you, boy, your number's up. Did you ever read? I think I'll just read it for you. <laughs> you got enough to go to read up here anyway, just time and life and look and gannet and string of newspapers and CBS and all that slop. ABC. Let me read you a hot one, boy. Let me read you a hot one. If I can find this thing. This is a, this is a gem. There's Rock Hudson. He, BT finished him off. <laughs> Let's see. Well, Billy Kelly, New Media Violence, Gilligan, <laughs> Jim Boss, Judy Garland, Joe Hall Roberts, Joe Lewis, Daryl Flynn, W.C. Fields, Les Pedro Peters too, Integration, George Myers. That's a good one. That's, that's Capone's chauffeur. George Mestic, Nick the Greek. That's another good one. Nicky Cruz. Kitty Genovese. America, heroin, the Pope's blessing, page seventy nine. There's our boy. Nothing like historical fact to clean up a a, a religious bigot. Eighteen ninety seven. He blessed the Grand Charity Bazaar in Paris. In five minutes it caught fire and hundred and fifty people burned to death. The Lord bless you. 1923, Princess Edna Batenberg blessed. Two weeks later, in a battle, 80 wounded, 13 killed by an attempted assassin, and she was spattered with blood from head to foot. 1981, John Paul II blessed Manila, was followed by a communist revolt and four typhoons. The Lord bless you, brother. 1978, blessed Sadat at an audience. He was assassinated in three years. 1980, John Paul welcomed the Japan Prime Minister Masayisha O'Hara, and he died of a heart attack four months later. 1967, Robert Kennedy. The Lord bless you, Bobby. Dead in the stone gold, dead in the market. 63, an audience with JFK in July. Lord bless you, Kennedy. November, dead in a micro. You better look out for that stuff. That stuff put the curse of hell on you, boy. Or put that thing on you, you say, back off, bud, don't put that hex on me. Martin Luther King, Jr., audience, the Lord bless you, bullet through the head. 67, Paul VI, fat team in Portugal, welcomed Premier de Salazar, blessed him. A year later, he had a stroke and was paralyzed. 1914, Dyer Edwards, English landowner, turned papist, blessed him. Two days later, went to Rome. Four days after he got the blessing, he was dead. Kaiser Wilhelm, 1908. Lord bless you, Kaiser. <laughs> Dethroned, <laughs> run out of the country. Emperor Maximil of Mexico, 1866, blessed him. Dethroned, killed by his own people. So the Pope blessed his widow. She died a maniac in exile. That's your papal blessing. Out there outside St. Peter, there's 20,000 people out there waiting for him to come out and pull on them. So they all run out of food, run out of clothing, and have to come to America to get it. Start hollering bread, not guns. Some of you Yankees, you're the biggest chumps ever lived. You know that? Swallow that stuff, all that stuff, bread, not guns. You know why they need bread in Ethiopia now instead of guns? Because they ran a Christian emperor out of that country, and his name was Eli Selassie. And they put up a communist regime. When they did, God cut off their rain and cut off their water and let them starve to death. You're going to get up and play the rock music, give them bread, not guns. You're a fool paying that bill. About to do it in South America, too, or South Africa. Luke 19. Luke 19. Luke 19. Here's the Lord coming back. Luke 19. If I ever got the role and that fella put that hex on me, I'd say, back off, bud. Knock it off, boy. Knock it off. I don't want that stuff on me. I'm an American. You understand? I'm an American. You, American, you know. American, you know. Well, I mean, you know, not 
pluralistic society, America, you know, was white Anglo-Saxon Protestant kind of way. <laughs> Some of you folks look like you lost your last friend. <laughs> What's wrong with being white Anglo-Saxon Protestant? You got something against them? They're a minority. Amen? You don't believe in knocking minorities, do you? <laughs> ah, yes, Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 11. He added these things. He added and spoke a parable. Verse 11, 1911. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because, watch it, they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Some of you can see. And he said, A certain nobleman went to a far country, heaven, to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Second coming. And he called his ten servants, delivered them ten pounds, and said, Occupy till I come. What happened to the fellow that messed up? Verse 24, And he said to them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. 26, For I say unto you, That unto every one which hath shall be given, from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But my enemies, that they are unsaved, which not I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. When Christ comes back, he does two things. He takes an unprofitable servant and takes him as rewards, and he doesn't get to reign over cities. Look at verse 17. Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Millennial reign. It looks like the Christian that lives after the flesh loses a millennial inheritance and doesn't get to reign with Christ on earth. Now, I don't know who will get uh, to run Detroit. But I hope maybe it'll be somebody like Larry Bartlett or Brother Vic or somebody. And I don't know who will get to run Flint. But uh, I could nominate a candidate to help run it. And uh, maybe it won't be Brother Denant. Maybe some old sick saint that prayed for Brother Denant for about 20 years. You know, you never can tell who, how it's going to be. I'd hate to measure my righteousness along the rights of some saints I've known. Uh, the Pope think he's a saint. Listen, the Pope is a backslider alongside some of the saints I've known. I've known some saints that put him out of the ring, boy. I've known some old women down in the South, boy, that have put up with nothing but trouble and sorrow and tribulation and privation for 35 or 40 years and never got any recognition, no write-ups and no rewards and nothing for it. And stayed true to God and prayed and upheld the Lord's ministers and gave the widow's might, boy. And when the Lord comes back, he'll give him rain over cities. So to answer your question, brother, <laughs> as far as I can tell, when we come back, some Christians will have no authority to reign with Christ. They'll be here, but they'll just be here as travelers, so be sightseers. Of course, it'll be great, but it'll be better to be able to do something for the Lord after he's done so much for you. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right, something else. Yes, sir? Uh, what happens to a person uh, when he dies? When he dies. All right, uh, take your Bible and get Genesis chapter uh, 50 in one hand. Genesis chapter 50. And the other hand, pick up Philippians chapter 1. And the other hand, pick up 1 Thessalonians 4. Philippians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians 4. And Genesis chapter 50. Genesis 50, Philippians 1, 1 Thessalonians 4. Now these have to do with what happens to a person when they die. And the first thing you need to note about this is when a person dies, their soul leaves the body. I'm in Genesis chapter 50, and Jacob has just died. Genesis chapter 50, verse 2. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And forty days were fulfilled for him, so were fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days, seventy days. Or right, now, seventy days after that fellow is dead to bury him. Matter of fact, come up there to verse 10. And when they bury him, up there at verse 10, and verse 11, and verse 12. Look at verse, uh, look at verse uh, 12. 
for his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah. Now what you want to notice here is this fellow dies, and 70 days after he's dead, he's buried. 70 days. The Job witnesses say when a man dies that his soul goes into the grave with his body. They say from the dies, the hell is the grave, and therefore when the fellow goes in his grave, he dies, and his soul goes in the grave with his body. Now here's the problem. Jacob's body doesn't go into that grave till 70 days after he's dead. What happened to him when he died? Look at chapter 49, verse 33. 49, 33. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed, watch it, and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. Now the spirit left that fellow, and that fellow was gathered to his people seventy days before he was buried. Well, how could the grave be hell even if he went to hell? He didn't go to hell, but if hell was the grave... He couldn't have gone there anyway because he left 70 days before he got to the grave. Let me show you another one like it in Genesis. Before we leave Genesis, pick up Genesis chapter 35. The Jehovah Witnesses don't know what they're talking about. Genesis, Genesis 35. Paul says when he's about to die, the time of my departure is at hand. Genesis 35, here's a woman dying. And this woman dies in childbirth. Genesis 35, 17, this woman has a baby, and she dies when she gives birth to the baby. Genesis 35, verse 17. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, watch it, as her soul was in departing, parenthesis, for she died, parenthesis, she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin, and Rachel died, comma, and was buried. What happened before she died? Her soul was in departing. Her soul left her body. All right, Philippians chapter 1. Now, I don't know how many funerals you've attended or how many you've preached. I've been to a lot of them, preached a lot of them, and I don't like funerals. I've never liked funerals. I don't like a funeral anywhere. I don't like a funeral, a funeral at home. I think funerals ought to be held in churches. But they have them in the funeral home, and the home. What a, what a, what a name for a morgue, a home. And there's something about those places. Uh, you stood over dead bodies made before and looked at them. And I don't care whether you're saved or lost, you can't look at a dead body without a peculiar feeling. And the feeling you have is that something has left that body. I don't care what you, you take a dead man, look at his eyes, and if he's dead, you know what those eyes look like? They look like somebody just vacated and pulled a shutter down there behind those things, and there's nobody in the house. The thing is gone. The same as thing with a body of an animal, a dead animal. I've buried many a dog. I've had about, oh, five German shepherds in about 30 years, and one or two of them hit by cars. One had heartworms and died before they were six, seven years old. I've had some live longer, nine or ten years. And you scared old German Shepherd, that German Shepherd, I don't know how you are about German Shepherds. That's the only kind of dog I have. I, as far as I'm concerned, that's the dog, is the German Shepherd. And I, maybe get a collie, you know, if you want something pretty close to it. But the rest of them are I just much, as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, and the thing is that they don't have any personality. I mean, a bull mastiff, you know, is a good fighter, you know, and a, and a setter is a good hunting dog. You may have a duck dog, you wouldn't sell for tooth out, and all that kind of stuff. But they just, you know, <laughs> just stupid. You don't have any personality. You take a German Shepherd, and he's got personality. <laughs> uh, they have little habits. One of them I had had a habit of picking up a brick in his mouth and carrying it. He liked to carry a brick around. One of them had, had a volleyball he liked to play with. And he'd never pick it up when he, he'd pull it with his paws before he'd pick it up and growl at it and scratch up half the yard before he, he'd want to turn the ball over to a certain place before he got it in his mouth, before he picked it up. They got funny, they got funny personality habits. A German Shepherd likes to sleep in soft things. You, you let a German Shepherd in your house, and he'll be in your couch, your bed, before you can turn around. There's some else that like the front seat in the car. You take a German Shepherd. I'm telling you now that I've raised a man. I've manhandled him. And put that thing in the back end of a station wagon. You get out of the grocery store and come back. He'll be in the back seat. 
You get out again, go in a grocery store and come back, he'll be in the front seat. And if you aren't careful, he'll be in the driver's side. <laughs> I've seen them. I've seen them. You take out old German Shepherd when they're young, I take mine half to manhandle them because I got little kids around all the time. I've always had little kids around all the time. I've got seven children, eight grandchildren, another one on the way, and my house just always filled with kids anywhere from two months old up to forty. <laughs> all those kids laid out end to end, they come they come uh, four months, a year, two years, three years, five years, seven years, then a little gap there. 11 years, 12 years, 13, 14, 15, 18, 20, 22, 24, 28, 30, 33, 38, 40, 42, and 44. You know, I'm kids together. And having a German Shepherd around, you can't afford to have a dog that'll get mad and bite little kids. So I make my German Shepherds behave. All my German Shepherds are sweet. You wouldn't believe it. They're sweet, lovable dogs. But they really are. But they'll intimidate you. They'll intimidate you. But a German Shepherd just to look at him and intimidate you, you know. And my dogs, the way I make them behave is when they're about, oh, six, seven months old, I give them a command. They have to do what they're commanded. You can't let that German Shepherd get a, get a, a lap on you. If you have a dog, he'll be your heady all the rest of the time. And when you beat those things, you can't use a newspaper or a bell or a stick. You get beating a German Shepherd like that, and he looks at it as a contest between you and him. And he gets older, and he'll begin to plan ways to get that stick or get that newspaper. Or he'll get mean. You have to chain him up, and then he'll get meaner. I mean, I know the German Shepherd. You can't police and discipline a German Shepherd if you want a dog to get along with kids. he got enough police in him already where he's ready to attack without you training him. And so when that dog comes like you have to make him obey. And I've had it out with every one of them when they got to be about nine months. About nine months, they'll try you, boy. They'll try you. You tell them to lie down, they won't lie down. You tell them to come here, they won't come here. And you have to get on them. I might have to bite the throat down on the ground, boy, and just smack him in the face till he's given it his toe. They had to bite me, too, man. I have one old German shepherd, his name was Chief, and his daddy was a war dog, World War II. And Chief, when he was a year old, he weighed about 90 pounds. And I was out at a meeting one time and trying to make him get in the car, and he wouldn't get in the car. He hide under the car, and I tried to call him, and it wouldn't come out. And I was wearing these light spring suits, and I had to go in and preach in a couple of minutes, and I had no way to get that dog out except going after him. And he would not come. So I finally crawled in after him, messed up my suit, mad enough, and got him by the paw and dragged him out, and he fit me, and that made me madder. And I slammed him around and picked that bird up by his front and his hind legs and kicked the door of the car with my, my foot and then swung him and threw him out of the car and slammed the door on him. Went on and preached. When I came back from preaching, I was going to have it out with him again in the car and open up the front door, and he leaned up against the front seat and opened the door, he went, <laughs> and raised that paw up. <laughs> so I knew I think it was okay, you know, after I didn't have trouble with it. <laughs> but you take, you take that thing right there, those, now those, those dogs have character. And yet when that dog dies, and I've had to bury him, I buried three of them in my backyard, I had to bury him myself, that dog dies, you see the corpse of that animal there? It's disanimated. There's a spirit that was there, and that spirit is no longer there. What animated that dog is gone. And it isn't like uh, just breath. It isn't like just breath. It's a definite spirit that was there. That dog's body is dead. It's just like the dog, the body of any dead dog in the world. It may have any dead dog, a chihuahua, or a poodle, or a pincher, or a setter, or a doberman pincher, or a a cocker spang or anything else, it's just a dead dog. But when that thing's alive, it has an, there's an animation there. Now, when you die, that thing that animates you, that makes you what you are, your personality, is gone. You see that corpse there and that thing? You sense that. I don't care if you save a loss, you sense it. I'll show you what happened. Now, this case of a saved fellow. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Philippians 1, 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is what? Gain. Gain. Now, do you, do you realize that? You have to die a sap, and you realize that's a gain? Did you know if you're unsaved, you don't get that? If you're unsaved, you don't understand a word I've said. 
I said, if you were saved, you were to die, you'd be better off dead than alive. Let's keep reading. If I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet I shall, what I shall choose I walk not. For I am in a straight betwixt two, two decisions. Watch carefully. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is what? What? He didn't say better. He said what? Far better. Now, if you're unsaved, you know what I'm talking about. The passage says, if you're saved and you're to die, you're in far better condition, dead, than you're alive. In fact, every Christian ought to have a little bit of suicidal mania about it. Every Christian should kind of, you know, kind of occasionally want to take the shortcut home. <laughs> lady said to me one time in the hospital, she said, well, I, I just know I'm sick and something wrong with me. I said, why? She said, well, I've been thinking about taking my life. She said, I'm not married, didn't have any children. And she said, my brother and sisters are all dead and I don't have any nephews or cousins. I'm just by myself. She said, I'm 50 years old. She said, I'm doing a little work, but just enough to pay my own bills. And she said, no, I've got a hospital bill I don't think I can pay. And I said, are you saved? She said, yes, I'm saved. And I said, well, then you're, you're all right mentally. And she said, well, I just thought I must be mentally sick because I've been thinking about killing myself. I said, no, that's a sign of a good, healthy mind. <laughs> I mean, if you're saved, you do think about it, you know. One thing get tough. Sometimes it seems a lot easier to die for Christ than live for Christ. That's natural. That's Paul. Paul said, you know what he said? I'm in a straight, that's a straight jacket, the narrow place, tough, between two, play, two decisions, whether to live, whether to die. Having a desire, desire, that's the first thing, to depart, wants to get out of it. But I said to me one time, I said, Ruckman, your problem is you're just yellow. He said, you want Christ to come back just because you're scared. I said, yeah, I know what's coming. I know it's coming. You bet your life. Even so, come Lord Jesus. <laughs> First Thessalonians 4, verse 14. First Thessalonians 4, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now what about those that are asleep? Chapter 5, verse 9. Here they are. Here's the Christians who are dead. First Thessalonians 5, 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch it. Who died for us, that whether we wake, the Christian's alive, or sleep, the Christian dead, we should live together with him. That means if I kick the bucket right now, I leave the body, I go to be with Jesus Christ, and up there with him, and I come with him to get my new body. Where is that? First Thessalonians 4.16. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, with a voice the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now how's he coming? 14. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, watch it, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. See that? They're with him when he comes. That means the only thing that slept was the body. The body slept down here, and the soul went up there, and when the Lord comes, he brings with them to get the body down here. So the answer for a Christian is when a Christian dies, the Christian is absent the body and present with the Lord, and the departs and he's with Christ, which is far better. Now about the unsaved, well, no question about the unsaved at all, and that can be illustrated by a very simple thing like this. There's a key, and you pick up the key, and you hold the key up, and then you let the key go. <coughs> And it does it every time. <laughs> it never falls up. Somebody said, there's no absolute. I'll tell you something absolutely true. If you take a key and let go of it and drop it, it'll drop down. That's an absolute. <laughs> you say, you know that, try it 150 million times, see how many times it falls up. <laughs> you know why it falls down? Because that's the natural way to go. You know why it falls down? Because there ain't nothing to take it up. If I was an airplane, it might be different. You see? 
The airplane has something in it that'll defy the law of gravity. I think there's nothing to defy the law of gravity. Now you unsaved, you got your soul in here, you have to see you when you die. You can't go up. You know why you can't go up? There's nothing you take you up. You go down. But if what say what's under your feet? Why don't you dig down and see? You know what's under your feet? Get your National Geographic. Down to your feet, right down there, it's molten nickel. You run down there about 500 miles so hot, you couldn't get an air conditioner to keep a bit cool enough to cut rock. It's liquid fire. Straight down. All right. Yes, sir. Um, in Isaiah 66, it says, And it shall come to pass, verse 23, from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. They shall be a horn to all flesh. Now the question is, this is there in the new heaven and new earth. Is this eternal? Now, my next part of the question is in Revelation 22. And uh, it says that they won't... Uh, Blessed are they do his commandments, for they have right to the tree of life, and may enter the city of gates of the city, both outer dogs and sorcerers, whoremongers, and so forth. The question is, is there a purpose for an eternal place where people can see on this earth forever, or is this just during a particular time? All right, Isaiah chapter 66. Now in Isaiah chapter 66, the passage there is talking about eternity, at least as far as verse 22 is concerned. For the new heaven and the new earth which I will make, and that's a reference to Revelation 20, verse 1 to 3. Shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed, that's verse 21, the Jews, and your name, that's the Jews, remain. So the Jew remains on the new earth out there in eternity. The earth is given to Abraham, he says in Romans chapter 4. Then he says in 23, it shall come to pass from one new moon to another, that's a Jewish feast, and from one Sabbath to another, that's a Jewish feast, shall all flesh, that shows us flesh out in eternity. Come to worship before me, saith the Lord. He's a new Jerusalem. And they shall go forth, the ones that come there in flesh, and look upon the carts of the men which have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall the fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. The passage of the stand looked like there is in eternity a remnant or a memorial of uh, sin where uh, a fellow can see somebody in hell. Now the problem comes, and it's quite a problem he asked about, the problem comes with 24, look upon the carcasses of the men. A carcass is a dead body. And the question comes, are there going to be dead bodies out there in eternity? Now the passage in Revelation chapter 20 says that death and hell go in the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. So that's the end of death. You don't have anybody dying in eternity. So if there's any carcasses there, it's the carcass of somebody who died somewhere before the new heaven and the new earth started. It's a memorial. Now as far as the people in hell goes where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, they're there. But those aren't carcasses. Revelation chapter 22, verse uh, 15. Revelation 22, 15. They're still in the lake of fire in eternity. But those aren't carcasses. Revelation 22, 15, For without our dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, and murders, and whoever loves and maketh a lie. Compare this with chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 8, In the new heavens and the new earth. But the fearful and unbelieving, and abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, there it is, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So you have an eternity, souls in the lake of fire, and the fire isn't quenched, and they're abhorring to all flesh. But then you have in the past, you just read also carcasses somewhere. Now I'm going to have to guess what I'm talking about, but I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess from this. You get Colossians chapter 2 in one hand, and get Ezekiel chapter 46 in the other. You're told here that in the millennium on this earth that the Jews in Israel will be observing the new moons and the Sabbaths. 
got Colossians chapter, Colossians chapter, uh, should be Ezekiel 45. Ezekiel 45 and Colossians chapter 2. And the passage you read in Isaiah said, from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another. All right, Ezekiel 45 and Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, Paul is talking about something in the future. Colossians 2 verse 16. Colossians 2.16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, that's a Jewish ordinance, or in drink, that's a Jewish ordinance, or in respect of a holy day, Jewish ordinance, or the new moon, there it is, or the Sabbath days, there it is, which are a shadow of things to come in the future. All right, now Ezekiel chapter 45, and this passage is in the millennium. In Ezekiel chapter 45, verse 16, and when Christ is on this earth in the millennium, there is also on this earth, evidently, a prince. If we compare the scripture with scripture, that prince would be David. And we read this in Ezekiel 45, 16. All the people of the land shall give this oblation for the prince in Israel. And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings and meat, there is the Jewish offering, and drink offerings, there's the Jewish ordinance. In the feast, there's Colossians. And the new moons, there's Colossians. And the Sabbaths, there's Colossians. Watch it carefully. In all solemnities of the house of Israel. So the passage there in over Isaiah has specific reference to what's on this earth for the nation of Israel in the new heaven and new earth, and not what's necessarily out in space. He shall prepare the sin offering, the meat offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings to make reconciliation, not for the sinner, not for the sin of the sinner, taking care of Calvary, for the house of Israel. There's a national offering, a national atonement for a nation being offered there. So if I was going to guess on the application of the passage, I would say this. I would say out in eternity, there's a lake of fire in eternity, and that lake of fire, the soul of the unsaved, the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. But those aren't carcasses. They're not carcasses in the first place because the body in eternity, the body an unsaved man has, will not be a body has arms and legs anyway. And secondly, a body out in hell would not be referred to as a carcass. A carcass is a dead body. And it looks like that in eternity out there on the new earth, uh, where the Jew is, but out there south of Eden, where the lake of fire is going to be in the millennium, there will be the carcasses of the men that sinned against the Lord before eternity started. And there will be a memorial for sin against God. Yes, sir. That's what it looks like. Yes, sir. Brother. My wife would like to know what the Bible says about the big name. No, it doesn't say a thing. No. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, the principle on it here is 1 Corinthians. Get 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, the thing about cremation is this. It looks bad. <laughs> uh, and the question is, should a Christian be cremated? Now, you know some of the brethren, now what they call super pious, and super stupid. And they have, the, they have these funny ideas about things where they can't seem to get a hold of anything. Uh, questions like uh, abortion and birth control and questions about marriage divorce. The thing I do is sex. Your modern fundamentalist is kind of a sex obsession neurotic and he has these wild ideas that if you get the place to downright impractical at times and nobody but a fool would espouse them. And one of these things, this matter of uh, about in a matter of cremation, I want to ask you something. What do you suppose they do down in New Orleans when a person dies? You know why they cremate them? There ain't room to bury them. See, people, sometimes people don't even think, suppose you died in Shanghai, where would they bury you? You know what the population of Shanghai is per square foot? Or Hong Kong or Sao Paulo down there in South America? You take down in uh, New Orleans, you know some of them buried in those Catholic cemeteries and vaults up in the air? Why, they, why they, it's because when the, when the floods down there, <laughs> you'd be 
drinking dead man's bones and dead man's blood in the city water. Half of New Orleans is below the water level. It's below sea level out there in some places. You couldn't you couldn't bury people out there. You kill all the people that are left alive. Hurricane comes in around New Orleans, boy, you you need to get out. You take up here, you know that you get this TV. I get letters, I get subscribers, I get letters from all my friends up here up north every time a hurricane comes down there. How are you, Brother Ruckman? Are you all right? We heard about the terrible news. Maybe you better move, but did it come to you? I've been through five hurricanes down there. You know, I do when I prepare for a hurricane, I drink one cup of coffee in the morning instead of two. You know. Sometimes I take two lumps instead of three. Uh, you know what you got in America? I'll get back to this here in a minute. But you know what you got down <laughs> when you got down there? What you got down there is what's called news media overkill. Everything the news media does, it just does to death in order to keep your interest. Don't you get that? Don't you do any good football right now? Every time a guy makes a run, they put up how many runs he made and how many, you know, and how many downs when there was so much to run, when somebody's playing on a night light for the playoff game. You know, here's the only man who ever ran, uh, you know, 50 yards in the third down when the score was tied on a night light for playing with the game and all that. Bunch of junk, man. They just throw a bunch of slop at you, don't you know that? It's an overkill. Now they got the camera down the line. This fellow moves that way and that fellow moves this way. And watch how he moves his hand. Watch how he moves his foot. It's an overkill. And when a hurricane comes down there, you take that last two that came down there. It was a terrible wind. It blew several leaves off some trees in my backyard, you know. <laughs> you say, well, it blew over one tree in my backyard. Yeah, it was a dead tree. been dead 15 years, man. You could have gone out there and breathed on it and fallen over and why they have all those people leave the Gulf Coast, they're all running up Montgomery, the, the, the highways are all jammed, the news media's down there taking pictures, look how the waves are beating on the pier. Oh, the saphead got his camera down on the beach level shooting up, man. He's shooting up so it looks like the waves on the pier, anywhere near the pier. Well, that Kate came through down there last week, there were guys out there swimming in that thing. I got pictures of guys out swimming that thing, you know. Surf's up. <laughs> <laughs> Why, you know, the night that hurricane came through there, that one about a month ago, the day before that came through there, I said to my wife, let's go play a racket ball. So I'm wife went for a racket ball at night, and I told David, so I'll be good fishing. Though. I went fishing. The, the morning was supposed to hit, we went fishing. About 20 mile an hour wind. All oh, that crazy, cockeyed junk. Everybody just in a panic. By leaving Hardy in full, Ramadi, million dollar business, you know. Ramadi in full, all the auditorium is full, all the high school, people away from their homes four and five days, patrol right down, threaten the rest, people who don't leave the beach. What a bunch of bunk, man. What a bunch of bunk. Well, I think I'm not a whole beach down there in Pensacola. I got about eight windows broken, some shingles blown, blown off. That's about it. You could have stayed down that thing and swum through the whole thing, you wouldn't have caught cold. That's, a, that's, a, that's an overkill. Overkill that stuff coming through there. And I have, you, people get them scared to death. The news media has controlled the American mind now where the news media could, could create a crisis and everybody would just panic. they just panic. I, uh, I've got a beat. I don't have a television set. And I turn the radio off. Hurricane comes through. I turn the radio on once every 12 hours. I figure that way you'll find all you need to know. Five minutes and 12 hours. And find out where it's coming there. Hot coordinates, our longitude, latitude, you know, everybody run like a bunch of mad fools. Let me ask you something. What that what that Seminole Indian do down there for two hundred years? Do you know Florida had Seminole Indians all over for two hundred years? They never knew when the thing was coming till it hit. They asked the one boy out Key West one time, an old timer down there lived down there eighty years, how many hurricanes he'd been through, he'd been through twenty five hurricanes. He said, How do you find it now? He said, Well, with all the radio information it kinda of takes the fun out of it. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, if you're right on the, let me give you some good advice. If you're right on the beach, okay, leave the beach. Okay, if you're right on the beach, leave the beach. That's, that's smart, you know. Unless you're, you know, 21 in good condition. <laughs> and if you're up on land, if you're in a trailer, if you're in a trailer, and it isn't really dog down good, it might be a good idea to get out of the trailer. Now, outside of that, ain't nothing to it, man. I mean, just prepare for the power to go off a couple of days and 
cook in the backyard, nothing to it. All right, now about this burying bodies. When a hurricane comes through, this water comes up in New Orleans, everybody gets polluted. The bodies weren't buried or weren't sacked above ground, so they are, are burned, so they burn them. Now, I had to preach a funeral about a year ago of the, where he was cremated. And I must admit, it's a funny feeling, you know, to stand there by a jar, <laughs> you know, and preach, you know. And think about, you know, a guy coming to your home and putting ashes in the ashtray, and it's the wrong tray. <laughs> but, you know, the way they do it now, the way they do it now, they don't really burn them anyway. They got this thing, you know, computerized, electronic, high-speed stuff, you know, like kind of microwave, you know. <laughs> and uh, I'm talking about a guy, he's, I know a guy that watches it, you know, and he said, your body lies down the table, you watch this glass, and all that happens, they turn this terrific thing, you know, and the body will just, you know, kind of draw up, you know, rigor mortis kind of, just kind of half rise, and then it just collapse. And when it collapses, it just all goes to ashes. Just a matter of just seconds, boy, just like that. Ain't no flame burning nothing up. Just all blows to pieces. Well, now, from a Christian standpoint, the reason why some Christians are abhorrent of it is it's uh, because of this. First Thessalonians chapter 5, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. See, it just looks bad. In fact, the idea of the Christian's body is burning, and it looks like he's burning in hell, or going to burn in hell, and of course he's not going to burn in hell, so it looks bad. So some of them object to those grounds. But, of course, if you're really saved, you know better. Because if you're saved, you're not in your body. And like I told you, you're gone from your body. You're departed from your body. It ain't going to be the difference to you. You can be like that color fellow said he wanted to be buried in a watermelon patch. So in the springtime, it could just drip down to his mouth because you ain't going to get it in your mouth after you're dead. You're buried. I tell my wife, if I have to get buried before the Lord comes, I hope I don't. I want to bury it at sea. I don't want to be buried in the ground. Just... Nothing, I just don't like the dirty old ground, the worms and stuff. I'd rather eat by crabs, you know, or something like that. And uh, there's just something, it just always seemed nice to me about just slowly sinking down in the, in, the, in, the, in the blue water, you know. Salt, clean, you know. Just sink down to the bottom, you know, but down you go. <laughs> but you know what, silly, you, you won't know what you're doing. You're going up over the Lord. You don't know what to do with your body. But I just, I just rather not, I don't want my kid to come to my grave and putting flowers on me where daddy's buried, you know, and drive by, you know, and daddy's buried out there. I'd rather him go down the beach, you know, and say, well, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been on real friendly terms with the water, real friendly terms. I was raised, you believe it or not, I was raised in Kansas, and every summer we'd drive from to Pika, Kansas, to Wilmington, Delaware, and Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, and I was raised in the beach. Every June, July, and August, I had no shoes on my feet. That's why I don't like them. My feet just grew out. I got nine and a half, uh, triple E. It is like a duck's foot. And uh, I grew up in that beach. And June, July, August, June, July, August, and then I got on to be a bathhouse boy, and Kansas took care of the beach houses and bathhouses and umbrellas, and then I got on to be a lifeguard. I lifeguarded in the beaches of a Atlantic City and up in there and then out in the parks and Gage Park. Now when I went to college, I was a swimmer in Big Six and Big Ten and swam. And now I've been saved about 35 years. I go out at about 11, 12 o'clock at night, take a mullet net, wait out there in the surf. Sometimes I get hit down at night with the waves. And I've always been a good term to surf. I've, I've gone body surfing the waves as big as these last two hurricanes in northeasters off the coast of Cape Hatteras up there in Carolina. I'm in waves 10, 15 feet high kind of a rough ride. <laughs> I mean, you don't come in like this, you know, you come in like that, it's mouth full of gravel when you get in. But I've always been on good terms with the water. I know the water. I know the water. I know what you can do it and what you can't. I know when to respect it, too. And I've been out there at night fishing in a plastic boat with a 400-yard net, two guys pushing out right before the hurricane came in. And got off a bar with a tide, taking off down the bar in eight, ten feet of water in the middle of the night, trying to take that net out and have the waves come in and take the net clean out the back end of the boat. And you know, it's, you know, when you're 58 years old, it ain't quite easy a job, you know, when you're 30. <laughs> and the thing goes the back end of the boat, and then the boat sink. And the other guy go on the water trying to get the boat up, and I got on a wool sweater for the winter. 
I'm going to the water trying to get that boat up, and, I, and that boat is a plastic boat, and it's torn at the side, and that torn part of that boat pick up that wool sweater. Pull out it, you know. The last time I surfaced up, I told the kid with me, I said, let her go, let her sink, man. And he said, okay, if you say let her sink, I'm going to let her sink. <laughs> we came on back in. What happened? You get tangled up in that boat, see, and that thing get a hold of a wool sweater, take you right out on the bottom, boy, you're a dead duck. You can't get out. So I know when to be careful. But oh, I like the water. It's always it like. I like it right now. I'm probably backslidden. I probably, I probably should have started that school in Cincinnati, you know, or, you know, in Memphis. Central located, you know, where the kids get a good job. We wouldn't have to fly as hard to get to meet them. But you get down near the ocean. The ocean will get a hold of you. Boy, get your blood, man. You hear those, you hear the waves hitting at night. So like I said, I'd like to be buried out in the water, but it don't make no difference, I mean. So you're dead, man, you're gone. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. First Corinthians 6, 13, a, a brutal verse. Meat for the belly, Bible's a plain book, and the belly for meats. Hey, like that, call your stomach your belly. Meat for the belly and the belly for meats. You know how you work? You know how you work? Feed your belly. <laughs> Ain't that a spiritual thought? <laughs> you work to feed your belly. People work to stay alive. All the labor of man is for his mouth, but the appetite is not filled. Meat for the belly and the belly for meat. So here you go. But God shall destroy both it, the belly, and them, the meats. So God's going to destroy a man's body whether it gets cremated or not. So technically, there's nothing wrong with cremation at all. It destroys the body, but the body's going to get destroyed anyway. I'll give you one illustration. We'll close this thing. Uh, John, uh, John Patton. Well, that's not Georgie. But John Patton, one of the greatest missionaries ever lived. He went to New Hebrides. When he left the island of Tawana over there, every adult uh, native on that island was a professing Christian. He went to a place called Aniwa first and got run off it. Wife died, missionary station burned to the ground, Bible burned up. He had to bury one of his children. If any one of us went through what Patton went through, we'd say, I must be out of the will of God, we'd have come on home. But those missionaries made a stronger stuff in those days. And he went off the next island, went to work on there, and when he got through there, every adult native in that island was a professing Christian. And when John Patton started to go overseas, a lot of people tried to discourage him. They said, where are you going? He said, New Zealand. They said, those people are cannibals. He said, so what? And one of them said, well, I just can't stand with all dying, and after I'm dead, a cannibal eating me. <laughs> and Patton said, but what's the difference between a cannibal eating you and a maggot eating you? See? Now, that's a thought. <laughs> now, after you're dead, you're dead. You had something, brother? Go ahead. For the New Testament church. Or All right, Acts chapter two and Matthew chapter ten. Acts chapter two, Matthew chapter ten. Acts two and Matthew ten. And then with your third hand, there's always a third hand here somewhere. Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians five. Now the problem comes up here. <clears throat> about what we call the, the body of Christ and the local church. And the people who teach the local church is the body of Christ we call Baptist Briders. And a Baptist Brider is a man that teaches that the body of Christ is the local church, and therefore there are many bodies because there are many local churches. Uh, the fellow who taught that at the uh, Baptist Fundamentalism was the president of Pacific Coast Bible College. I forget his name, but it's in Texas. When he got up and gave the keynote address on what the church was, he gave the Baptist bride position. Now, I'll show you what the Baptist bride position is, and then we'll look into the scripture. The Baptist bride position is this. It comes from uh, uh, Ashland, Kentucky, and the fellow per first published the papers on this position is a fellow named Graves, and his uh, position was called Landmark Baptist. And Landmark Baptist out of Ash, Kentucky, printed what they call Landmarks, the Baptist faith. And one of the landmarks was the Baptist church for the body of Christ. And that teaching was this. That teaching was Christ founded one true church. And that true church is a local church. 
Therefore, if you can find the one true local church that Christ founded, you have Christ's church. And since Christ's church is his body, the local church is the body of Christ. And since you must be baptized by water to get into the local church, baptism by water puts you into the body of Christ. Now, you can see right away that's a church Christ teaching. That's Camelot teaching. I've taken the water not only puts you in the local church, but puts you in the Christ body itself because Christ's body is the local church. Now, that has further ramifications. If you say the local church is Christ's body and you find the one true church that Christ founded, and that is his body, you get in that church, you make up the bride of Christ because the body of Christ is his bride. That means the marriage of the Lamb, the bride, sits down at the table with Christ, and the bride is a Baptist bride. That's what that means. Well, where does Martin Luther come in? He's a saved man, but he's not a Baptist. He's a Lutheran. Well, he's not in the bride. Well, what does he do? Wait on the table? <laughs> Here's John Wesley. Is he in the body? No, he's a Methodist. He's baptized wrong. You know what you've got there? You wouldn't believe this, but you've got Jesse Jackson and Truman. Good old cousin Harry Truman and Rockefeller sitting at that table as part of the body of Christ, the Baptist, and Luther and Wesley waiting on them on the table. That's a strange doctrine. And about the time you start that, the Baptists say, oh, well, no, Truman wasn't a member of a true local Baptist church. And now you're going to have to shuffle the deck, aren't you? Which Baptist is the body of Christ? Do you ever stop to think about this? Suppose I wrote a letter, suppose I was Paul, and I'm not. But suppose I was Paul, and I wrote a letter, and I said, To the church in Flint, Michigan, greetings. Who would get the letter? <laughs> you ever think about that? Here's the fellow says, Why, the church at Ephesus, the church at the local church. Is that so? Which local church? Why, if that letter came to Flint, you know what happened? Every Catholic priest in this town would say it's for us. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And about the time he said that, the Campbellite would get up and say, Why, that isn't for you, that's for us. We're the church of Christ. The word Catholic's not even in the Bible. It's for us. <laughs> and about that time the Baptist said, No, sir. No, sir. The body of Christ, the Baptist church, it's for us. And the Northern Baptists say, wait a minute, it isn't for you Southern Baptists, we're here for you here. <laughs> and the Primitive Baptists say, you're both apostate, it's for us. And the Bible Baptists say, you Primitive Baptists got the wrong doctrine, it's for us. And about that time, some independent, independent, wildcat, off-brand, freelance Ruckmanite would over here would say, you don't believe the Bible, it's for us. <laughs> you're the mess, you see the mess you get into? You know what you do there? You're dividing Christ up into bodies. There's only one body. You've got to get the difference between the body of Christ and a local church. Now, pastors tend to do this, and I'm a pastor. Pastors tend to overemphasize the local church at the expense of the body, because the body includes Christians who are not in the local church, and may include Christians that don't even attend the local church. Evangelists will tend to emphasize the body and will not emphasize the local church because the evangelist is drawing his income from all kinds of places. <laughs> See? <laughs> and he's not dependent entirely upon the local church, so he'll tend to slight the local church. Now, I know just exactly what I'm talking about, whether you think I do or not. I've started three local churches from scratch. I mean, three local churches from one or two families. And I was a full-time evangelist for 12 years with no regular income and no evangelistic corporation or anybody behind me. I know what I'm talking about. When I went to Bob Jones, I was in a ministerial class led by Gilbert Stenholm, and we had 1,200 preacher boys in that class, and the fellow in charge of that ministerial association had never been an evangelist or a pastor a day in his life. And he was in charge of teaching 1,200 young men how to set up churches. What could he teach them? He couldn't teach them one cotton-picking thing in this world. Any any education you got at, at Springfield or Arlington or even Tennessee Temple would have been better than you got at Bob Jones if you talking about setting up a local church because they knew more about how to set one up. 
And you say, how'd you get through there? Well, I hung out with the wrong crowd. When I was at Bob Jones, I didn't believe everything I heard. I was hanging out with Norris's boys. I got to know something about it. Now, I'm going to give you three differences. We're going to read these in a minute. I'm going to give you three differences between the local church and the body of Christ, which shows you they're not the same. All right, number one, the local church is an organization. You got that? It's an organization. It has deacons. It has a bishop. It has a place to meet. See? It's an organization. It has elders. It has ways and means of taking care of widows. It takes up collections. It supports the ministry. It's an organization. The local church is an organization. The body of Christ is an organism. The body of Christ is alive. You are members of his body, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Ye are lively stones built up into a spiritual priesthood. The body of Christ is an organism. All right, number two. The local church was never a mystery in either testament. The local church, if you want to know where the church started, Stephen calls Israel in the wilderness a church in Acts chapter 7. He says the church in the wilderness. There's nothing mysterious about a local church. You had a church because of the Old Testament. The word church means a call-out assembly. Any call-out assembly is a local church. The Masons are a local church. The Delta 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 is a local church. The Kiwana is a local church. The Knights of Columbus is a local church. That's a call-out assembly. There is nothing mysterious about a call-out assembly. Anybody knows what a call-out assembly is. But the church in Ephesians is called a great mystery. This is a great mystery. Nevertheless, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Then they can't be the same. Number three. There are unsaved people in the local church. Will you grant that? I don't know a pastor in the world that won't grant that. I've got some unsaved people in my church down there. Any pastor probably has one or two. Southern Baptists got them by the score. <laughs> Northern Baptists got them by the thousand. Who'd be dumb enough to think everybody in a local church was saved? Boy, you take the first Methodist church of Detroit? Whew! United Methodist Church, the Northern Presbyterian Church of Detroit, stuff filled with unsaved people. All right? The last thing is there are unsaved people in the local church, but bless your soul, there are no unsaved people in the body of Christ. If you're in Christ, you're part of his bone, part of his flesh, you're saved. Now, those are three differences. I could give you a couple more that are more minor, but those three major differences show you they cannot be the same. Now, the old-time Christian used to do this. You say, you send that fellow Baptist fundamentals and preached heresy? Hey, sure did. And they probably thought Ruckman was a heretic. I ain't the heretic. You take old Stuart Custer and say, if we get the judgment seat of Christ, we'll find out who's the biggest heretic, Ruckman or Origin. You don't have to wait that long, bud. That Bible says in 1 Corinthians, there will be heresies manifest among you, but those that are right may be approved. Anybody can tell who's teaching a heresy if you just get in his Bible and check his Bible. You don't have to wait till the judgment seat of Christ. I'll get to this thing in a minute, but see, the Bible gets you going. If you've got any preaching, you can't spend time reading the Bible. Pretty soon you open your mouth, you can't shut it. <laughs> you take any preacher preaches better after somebody's been in his pulpit for three days. Brother do not. Well, I've been about three days when he opens up. He'll open up like a steam valve, everything wide open. And because if you're called to preach, you can't hear another fellow preach without getting stirred up. Isn't that right, brother? I have those guys out of my place and preach, you know, and by the time they get through, I'm, I'm just spinning my wheels, man. I hit the ground running. But you take this kind of business here, uh, that, that, the, the heretic is the man teaching something contrary to what the book says. I'll give you one conversation I've done with it. I'm down the spa, and I'm taking the steam room. I still go to the spa once in a while. I pump iron, you know. Not not much, you know. God knows. I mean, I, at my age, you know, you're not bodybuilding. You're just care and maintenance. <laughs> and, I, and I'm I'm there in the, I'm in the steam room. I'm not talking to this guy. He's about 22. And he's saying, well, you're a preacher. Yeah, you're a Baptist preacher. Well, so forth and so on. And I'm talking to a while, and pretty soon he says, well, how do I know who to believe? I said, what do you mean? 
He said, well, you guys quote scripture and say, you're right. I go to the Catholic priest, he quotes scripture, and he says he's right. I go to the church Christ preacher, he quotes scripture, you all quote scripture. And he said, you all talk like you're the only ones who are right. You all insist you're right, another thought is wrong. He said, I don't, know, I don't know who to believe. And I said, you're kidding. And he said, no. I said, how old are you? He said, 22. I said, you've been to college? He said, yeah, I got a college education. I said, you'll be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> He said, what do you mean? I said, if you tell me you're 22 years old and have a college education and you can't tell when a man's lying to you out of the scripture, you'll be ashamed of yourself. The idea of a man being a grown man able to read and doesn't know that book well enough to know when a preacher's lying. That's disgusting. You read a morning newspaper, you ought to have know that book well enough to know when a preacher's perverting scripture. Sure, you can make it say anything. We all know that. You say, Ruffman, how do you know you're not kidding me? Check the book. You got a book, go home and read it. See if I added to it. See if I took from it. See if I took it out. Check me out, boy. Well, I can tell you how to tell a man lying. See if he puts something in there that wasn't in there. Or see if he takes out something that's in there. Or see if he takes it out of the context in which it appears. You can make the Bible say anything. All you got to do is add to it, take from it, take it out of the context. If I wanted to, I don't want to. But if I wanted to, I could make the biggest mess you ever saw. Um, you talk about heresy. Man, I could put you up a church you wouldn't believe. I know where the verses are. I'll go home and start me a new church, the church that Christ founded. And I could get ahead of all of them. Because I could say, Thou art Peter. And upon this rock, that's my name, my name Peter, that's my name. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. Here be my first fundamental, come to Bethel and transgress. <laughs> that's Amos chapter 4. Here my next one, there's a time to dance. Please ask this. Here my next one, there's a time to kill. <laughs> Here's my next one, the tabernacles of robbers prosper. <laughs> And they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God brings abundantly. Here's my next one. They that tempt God are delivered, and the wicked are happy. Here's my next one. <laughs> oh, I know what the scriptures are. Sure, man. Here's the next one. You shall surely not die. <laughs> Here's my next scripture. Hang all the law and the prophets. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. And then here's my first sermon. The Lord is my shepherd. I ain't going to want. He maketh me to lie. <laughs> but I said, go on, preacher, go on. He said, he maketh me to lie down beside the still. <laughs> now all you have to do to mess that book up is take something out that's in there or put something in there that ain't in there or take it out of the context. You know what's wrong with you Christians? You don't spend enough time in that book to know when somebody's pulling the wool over your eyes when they're not. You think a guy has to be called to preach and go off and study. For, that isn't right. That isn't right. If you're saved and you could read, you ought to spend time in that book and know what's going on. Or if you want to spend any time in that book, you read that book through uh, in a year, reading ten pages a day. Ten pages a day. That'll, get, that'll really get you through. That'll get you through two times a year. Two times a year. Ten pages a day. How long have you been saved? You can say 15 years. You haven't read that book through 15 times from cover to cover. Five pages a day, man. That's two pages, both sides, and one page, one side. <laughs> you couldn't do that in a day. You've been saved 15 years. You haven't read that book through 30 times. That's ten pages. Look here. That's five sheets of paper. Both sides of five sheets of paper once a day through two times a year, 30 times 50. You don't do it. I know you don't do it. I know you don't do it because I know how hard it is for me to do it. I've been saved now 36 years. I'm going through 102 times now. That'll be a little over, that's about three times a year. I'm through 102 times to uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. Uh, that's only three times a year. Now, three times a year, me and I'm reading. That's a pitiful thing to admit. 
That's what I'm reading about 20 pages a day. Now, I read 500 words a minute. What am I doing reading even 20 pages a day? I ought to be reading 40 pages a day. Of course, my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. As a matter of fact, I'm no good now about it all. They're getting real bad on me. I had enough beating the softball and tennis ball and hockey pucks and fingernails. If I could just, if I could just control myself, <laughs> I still have my eyesight. But I, no fool like an old fool, you know. I played field hockey last Saturday I was playing with them. I mean, them sticks were flying. You pray for me. <laughs> and so I ought to be doing better than what I do, but the thing is, you don't read the book enough to know when you're getting fooled and when you're not getting fooled. All right, now I'm going to give you the verses now. Now, this first one here is on a local church being called out. Matthew, this is long before Pentecost. Matthew 10, 1. And when he had called to him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits. That's the calling out of the New Testament church. That takes place before Pentecost, before the crucifixion, and all those fellows have been baptized by John the Baptist. That's the calling out of a local church. Twelve disciples. Look at verse uh, 4. Are there any unsaved there? Look at verse 4. Well, the treasure is a devil. <laughs> a local church, he's an unsaved man. See there? That isn't the body of Christ. Judas is not the body of Christ. That's a local church. Or well, now that local church becomes an organism in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, here comes the Holy Spirit down, and here's the organization there, the local church is there, and in the Holy Spirit, 2-4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, that's when the local church becomes not just an organization, but an organism. The reason why Acts chapter 2 is such a tough place is in Acts chapter 2, the local church is the body, and the body is the local church. That's why it's so confusing, you see. Now, after that, you've got a local church here, and one here, and one there, and one there, and one there. But in Acts chapter 2, the body is the church, and the church is the body. Because in Acts chapter 2, all the saved people are there, and they're all in one organization. So if you send a letter to the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, only one church would get it. Because there's only one church there. But then you get later on through the Pauline epistles, you've got the church at Colossia, the church at Ephesus, the church at Galatia, the church at Thessalonica, and John writes to the seven churches, plural, not the body of Christ, the seven churches of Asia Minor, Ephesus, Smyrna, Sardis, Pergamos, so forth and so on. All right, Ephesians chapter 5. So we have to get the distinction between churches, which are local organizations set up, and a body called the church. Ephesians 5. Now this here is the body. Ephesians 5, verse 23. Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, if the church is subject to Christ, so that the wife be thrown husbands and everything. Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church, singular, and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, there's a sinless body, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, everybody saved, but that it should be holy without blemish. Verse 30, for we are members of his body, not just a local church, of his flesh and his bones, an organism. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. It's an organism. This is a great mystery. There's nothing mysterious about a local church. A local church is a call-out, organized assembly. This is a mystery. This is a great mystery. Nevertheless, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Oh, I will close here. In closing, let me say this. The old-time Christians had a very good concept of the church, which we today would do well to adopt. They used to speak about the church militant and the church triumphant. What they meant was this. They meant that the body of Christ, I don't say invisible, invisible. I don't do that, and I don't talk about a universal church against a local church. Those are Catholic terms, and I don't believe in that. I don't believe in a universal body run by a bunch of priests, nuns, and a bunch of that business. I don't believe in that. But I believe there's a body and a local church. The local church is visible. The body is visible, too. But part of the body you can't see, and the reason why is because part of the body is triumphant. 
Now, when we talk about the church militant and the church triumphant, we mean this. The church militant is the body of Christ left on this earth composed of saved people who are still in a battle and a fight against the war of the flesh and the devil. That's the church militant. The church triumphant is the Christians who've died, and they've gone home to glory, and they've laid down their sword and shield down to the riverside, ain't going to study war no more. Oh, I ain't got a beautiful song about that. If I can, I've, I've heard it sung for years and years as a, a duet that goes, All the friends that now are waiting in the cloudless realms of day who are calling me to follow where their steps have led the way. They have laid aside their armor, and their earthly work is done. They've laid aside the armor. Then they have kept the faith with patience, and the crown of life they've won. Now that thing there says when you get through, you lay down the sword and the spear and shield, you quit fighting. That's the church triumphant. That's a good distinction to make. Because it keeps calling your attention that while you're here, you're in armed combat. And that keeps the Christian on his toes. That'd save a lot of Christians from going to sleep. Answer your question. Answer your question is I believe the local church is before Pentecost. It's called out by Christ of disciples. It's an organization. The local church today is composed of saved people who are baptized into a local congregation. And as far as I'm concerned, a Bible-believing Baptist church is the closest thing to that you can find on the earth today. I wouldn't say that all Baptist churches were scriptural. I wouldn't say anything in a Baptist church was scriptural. But what I can see studying Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Jewish, hard-shell, charismatic, Church of God, Assembly of God, Pentecostal, Nazarene, Western Methodist, United Methodist, Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist, Primitive Baptist, hard-shell Baptist, Two-Seed One Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah Witness, Catholic, Mormon, J.W. No Heller, all this, as far as I can see, a Bible-believing Baptist church is the closest thing to it there is on the earth today, and that's why I pastor a Bible-believing Baptist church. <laughs> and that's the local church. I believe in addition to that, you have a body of Christ made of all saved people, and if a Catholic is saved, he or she is my brother and sister in Christ, and I may not be able to have membership with them. But on some things, I can have fellowship with them. On some things, I cannot have fellowship with them. It's never right to do wrong get a chance to do right. You can go as far as you can along the right road with anybody, but it's always a compromise to go on the wrong road with anybody. Brother Denant, come ahead. That'll be enough for today. You all been with two hours and five minutes. It's a wonderful, wonderful life when you know have been listening to the Wonderful Life broadcast. If you have problems, questions, or request a letter, mail them to the Wonderful Life broadcast in care of this station or to the Twin Cities Baptist Church, G5339 South Saginaw, Flint, Michigan, 48507. It's a wonderful